what we're looking at is the base to a jointer. It's a Delta Milwaukee jointer made somewhere in the early 1940s probably. At the moment mine is in pieces because I'm doing a restore. It's all over the shop right now. I'm not going to do a completely thorough breakdown of this. More like I want to show you some things that I learned along the way that will apply to these Series 37 jointers or whatever they're called. There are already plenty of breakdowns out there on the internet right now. So for my part, I think I can help you best by just giving you a little bit of advice about some of the procedure that works quickly to help you get through this. It's a pretty big undertaking. The machine breaks down into a million pieces, but really in terms of design, it's kind of a paragon of, well, dependability and simplicity, which is one of the reasons why I found this model. Of course, I'll give you links to this document, and it gives you some really common sense instructions and, and basic maintenance procedures and stuff. Some of it's kind of surprising, really, how they, for example, how they would have you grind the knives while they're in place. Okay, will I do that? I don't know. Not sure yet. But one of the great things about this thing is that it breaks down into really simple parts. Most of the parts are either solid metal and they're just not even going to break. They just have some rust on them that needs to be wired brushed. Or else they're replaceable nuts and bolts that are kind of easy to find and consumable parts like bearings. Most of the specialty proprietary stuff uh, you're just not going to break it and if you do break part of it you could probably weld or otherwise fabricate some replacement for it. This is why a joiner like this is so much better than anything that's on the market now. For mine, I am in the process of replacing the bearings and the knives, so I'll give you links down below to find those parts. The first thing on your mind is going to be rust removal. That's the number one topic of discussion here today. Wake up. This is the idea that I want you to drill into your head. When you're restoring a piece of metal like this, shiny is not necessarily flat. Let me tell you a story. About 30 years ago, I was at a friend's house, or garage specifically, and we were tinkering in his dad's garage, who his dad was sort of an auto body mechanic. They, they were just mechanically inclined. I was from a family of carpenters, so I had no mechanical inclination. There was a car sitting there in the garage that had a hole in it with some body putty in it. And so I picked up a piece of sandpaper and started rubbing and he quickly, my buddy quickly said, no, stop it, don't. What's the problem here? I'm a teenager who's also a carpenter. I know everything there is to know about sanding. You just rub. No, 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 no. The idea was that when you try to hand rub out a surface, you dig and you don't ever want to dig, especially when it's on a, either a plane or a curve, like on a panel on a car. Now to many of you out there listening, you're thinking the point is obvious, I know that. But not everybody realizes this, because our first instinct is to see you know, flaws in this and just, and it will turn shiny, it will look like a mirror, but it won't be in plane, and that's the goal here. I want you to think of plane, that is a flat surface like this, as being a still pond, and it has a water level that we want to decrease as we sand. This is flat, so it's okay. But if you take something that isn't flat, like sandpaper, what you're doing instead of lowering the whole level is digging a scoop out, and that's a no-no. Okay, enough story time. Let me tell you specifically the method that I used to restore all of the plain parts. We start at the belt sander with one of its belts. Belt sander belts are a great source of super aggressive, super durable sandpaper. In this case, I'm using 80 grit. Roll it out and make yourself a template to make quarter sheets because this is a quarter sheet sander, which is to say that it's designed to cut a standard piece of sandpaper into quarter sheets, but this stuff is way more rugged. So here's a template, utility knife, 
make this. Uh, put your narrow side this way so that when it folds into the sander, it folds easily. The cloth has a sort of grain to it, an orientation, and it just folds more easily that way. People like random orbital sanders. I prefer quarter sheet sanders. Uh, you don't have to buy specialty stuff. I mean, I guess this is specialty, but it's still just plain old sandpaper. Instead of buying those special pads, this is cheaper and easier and more aggressive. Why am I using two palm sanders? Well, it's an algebra problem. A train leaves Boston at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday, and if there are two trains, it goes twice as fast. Don't think about the math too much. It's a really irregular part, so it gave me a lot of grief. A sandbag is great for that. It's just some old blue jeans with sand in it. If you don't have a pair of these yet, <laughs> you should make some. Oh, rust. How far do we go? It's up to you. You choose your own level of involvement. As for me, I'm stopping there. Even though I wasn't able to lower the water level all the way down to get this scratch out, and there's still a little bit of pitting here too. I've already done the in-feed and out-feed table, so I'm getting sort of sick of doing this, but that's really not that bad. This is the sort of texture you can expect with 80 grit and, well, I don't know, a couple minutes of time. It's not too bad. In my case, I'm also going to cheat and cover my fence surface with a piece of high-density polyethylene. Once the noisy part is over, find yourself a cheap stone. This is literally from a dollar store, and I'm using mineral oil. Mineral oil is not the best. I would prefer to have something thinner, but since it's thick, uh, it doesn't run everywhere. Can you do it dry? Maybe, probably. The palm sanders, step one, is to get it flat in the most crude sense. But now we're going to start to get it really in plain. Everything after this is just a matter of getting the scratches out. Think of your sanding as rust removal, and then think of the stoning as turning it into a perfectly flat plane. But that perfectly flat plane will still be scratched, so later we'll have to buff all the scratches out. Stay tuned. You wouldn't happen to have a milling machine by chance, would you? You'll start to see high spots emerge. Right here, it's kind of shiny. Right here and right here. From the factory, it's not going to be as true as we can get it with a stone. The important thing is keep the stone flat and don't roll it over the edge. Does it matter which direction we sand? Yes, we are putting a grain into it, and that's because this is a fence. And since we're going to slide wood this way, I want all of the scratches to be parallel with this axis. Even though eventually our scratches are gonna be as fine as frog hair. Full length strokes. Don't stop the stone short like this. Because if you do, you're going to get lasso loops. We want lines, continuous lines. Not a match. By a chance, would you? Before we move on, how to test it to see how true it is. This is a well-machined ruler, so even the smallest gap in between them will let light through. If you pass that test, you made it. Looks like right there, there's a low spot. Once you've settled for true enough, it's on to the next step. 
diamond stones. I do not necessarily recommend this product, but if we look at it as the price of doing business and just expect these to be consumed by doing this, it's worth it for the jointer. These are really cheap and they're just pieces of thin diamond impregnated metal ranging from 400 all the way up to 1200 grit and they're foam backed. There are pros and cons to using something like this. Pros first, cheaper than sandpaper, also much faster. Uh, it's diamond, it'll get the job done for you. But the con is major. How do you grab a hold of this? If you use your hand, it's going to get old fast. And so I devised this thing. It's made on the bandsaw and it has lips here that hold it. Not so bad, except because of how many surfaces I had to do, pressing down got hard, so I added weight. Once you get to this point, much, much better for the 12,000 repetitions you have to make. All in all, this product wouldn't be bad if it were a little bit thicker. It's very hard to grab. If it were on a piece of quarter inch steel, these would be lovely. But as it is, I made do. I made my way through the project. What I'm about to say will probably be controversial. I started with oils and quickly decided that the mess, the time, and the trouble just forget it. Use them dry. It goes just as fast and we just want this project to end. And so we go 400 first, same rules as with the stone. Don't curve over the edge and make a full stroke all the way from start to finish. Without oil, you'll feel as it cuts and when it doesn't, it gets gummed up. At some point, it will stop cutting and start skipping as though there's something causing friction in between. Kind of like the way that a file gets gummed up when you're trying to file aluminum. Well, that's something like what happens here. Material gathers and, well, just rub it away with a piece of cotton cloth and then you're back in business. This is less trouble than trying to constantly carry a slurry away. You can see a low spot right there. We have to set realistic expectations about what we can get. This is the last one. I've worked my way all the way down, or up rather, to 1200, but I don't think that's particles per square inch. It's some arbitrary unit probably. So don't expect these to give you mirror quality finish, but what you can expect is a really nice finish for what we're doing here. This is perfect. The last step is to get it nice and clean and then I'll apply a finishing wax. That deep scratch is all but gone and the pitting I just have to let go because I don't have the patience. This is the same old can of finishing wax that was given to me many years ago by one of my friend's dads. He gave me the wood lathe that I have. When he moved he had no use for it anymore. And I helped him move his furniture, and he gave me the lathe in exchange. Yeah, I have to say, if you want to build up your tool arsenal, one of the best ways you can do it is to refurbish old stuff like we're doing here. But also, getting broken stuff and acquiring things from helping people out, that's another way to get a lot of tools. In fact, I have a pretty well-established workshop right now. And I could probably count on one hand the number of tools I bought new. <laughs> new tools don't last this long. I think they have bad juju in them. <laughs> there are other parts that have planes that you have to work on. The infeed table, or wait, is that the outfeed table? Doesn't matter. Infeed and outfeed table. 
aside from doing these surfaces, you'll also have to sort of true up these surfaces here that ride on the base. But that's not quite as much work. It just has a couple of skis. Even though these are two separate skis that are removed from one another, we want them to be in the same plane. And so a good way to true them up is using a granite floor tile that has some sandpaper on it. You get the idea. I've already done this. It was pretty bad at first. I did it to this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. Notice that there are four pads in this case. Okay, I want to end it here for now. Because, let's be honest, there are few topics of discussion that are as bland and featureless as the plane surface. Oh, what, did that joke fall flat? And so next in the series, I made a video about putting the bearings in for this, pressing them in place, and that will be the next part. And then the final part, probably final part, will be just bits and bobs about putting it all together. I would apologize for the length of these videos, or this video in particular, but it can't be overstated that this is a considerable amount of work, and so know what you're getting into before you jump in and buy a $75 joiner that's a rusty mess. Although it's satisfying to see old become new and functional, and especially because it will have that solid metal aesthetic, it's still a ton of work, and if you aren't willing to make the commitment, then don't do it. Okay, moving on. Thanks for joining me, and see you later.